Good morning. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. It says to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of the hope that, yeah, that is in you. And the choir is going to be singing the song, My Hope is Jesus. <laughs> summer, the changing of leaves, food on my table, a good place to sleep, clothes on my back, and shoes on my feet. 
I have been blessed I have been blessed God so good to me How precious are his thoughts of you and me No way I could count them There's not enough time So I'll just thank him for being so kind God has been good So good I have been blessed <clears throat> Arms that will raise A voice that can talk Hands that can touch And legs that can walk Ears that can listen Eyes that can see I've got to praise him As long as I breathe I have been blessed Father and mother who nurtured and raised Brothers and sisters, memories made Our pastor to lead us, the power to pray Stripes that can heal and the blood that still saves I have been blessed I have been blessed, God so good to me how precious are his thoughts of you and me No way I could count them There's not enough time So I'll just thank him for being so kind God has been good So good I have been blessed We live in a country, the greatest on earth. Our stand is for freedom and what it is worth. She stands in the harbor, Miss Liberty calls. All gave some and some gave all <clears throat> for me to be blessed. He's my shoulder to lean on when I am down. The rock where he leads me when I'm overwhelmed The place where he hides me under his wing He's not just a song, he's the reason I sing I have been blessed <clears throat> I have been blessed, God so good to me how precious are his thoughts of you and me No way I could count them There's not enough time So I'll just thank him for being so kind God has been good So good I have been blessed God has been good so good we have been blessed well most of you who know me well know whenever I don't have a handkerchief in my pocket, that's when my head gets to leaking, amen? So it'll be okay. It, it, it touched my heart as Lisa was singing that song because many of you already know this about Sister Lisa, but uh, she was 30 years old when the Lord saved her dad. And her dad was pretty much of a wild man. I, I think you could easily say that. Her dad gave her mother, has been a Christian for quite some time, and her dad had given her mom a lot of headaches through the years. I guess given the whole family a lot of headaches through the years. And here a few weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, her mom and dad were on the computer singing, or on Facebook or something, singing a duet together, singing praises to the Lord. And I'll tell you what, when you stop to think about the way that the Lord works in the lives of people, when God gets a hold of someone's heart and God does a work of grace in their heart and the wonderful change that he makes, it's just such a great blessing. And uh, so it's, it touches my heart to think about that. Go ahead and stand with me, please. We'll go to the Lord in prayer before we proceed on this morning. 
Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, as we come to thee in prayer, Lord, as we think about the many blessings which thou has been pleased to bestow upon us, Father, there are so many material blessings which we have received from thy hand. Father, to be able to have houses to live in, which most of them are warm. Father, they're warm in the winter, cool in the summer, dry in the rain, Father. Lord, thou has also given to us a wonderful building to be able to come out to worship in. And Father, far above all of the material blessings, we have the blessing of thy Son, Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that was made there upon the cross of Calvary, that we may have forgiveness of our sins. And Father, I pray that as the word goes forth this day, that thou would give to me liberty and wisdom, Father, to proclaim the truth of thy word in the way and manner which is pleasing and honoring and glorifying unto thee above all else. We pray, Lord, for those who are here today that are lost. We pray, Father, that this may be the day that thou would save their souls. We pray and ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Back many years ago when I was still young, amen, I was rummaging around in an old barn and found a very peculiar looking part. Now, some of you that means something to you, some of you it doesn't. But I'd found a very peculiar looking piece and the, it looked kind of like a small hammer with a head that swiveled around on it. And that mysterious part turned into quite a conversation piece. We lived in a farming community and the piece came from an old barn. It didn't come from a NASA lab. Whatever it was, I would oftentimes ask some of the old farmers around there. I'd say, what do you think this is? And I would always think, you know, it's, surely someone's going to know what it was because it was just such a peculiar looking, look, looking piece or part. Uh, whatever it was, it was well designed. It was made in the USA, which is a rarity for today, amen. Uh, but it was well designed, it was well made, and some people would joke and they would say, well, it was a muffler bearing installation tool. Some of you know what that is, amen. Other people would take and say, well, it's a detorquing device for torque converters, and some of you know what that is, amen. The number one answer was that people would take and say those, they'd take and say, well, it's a paperweight. It's a well-made, well-designed paperweight, amen. Uh, never did figure out exactly what the thing was for, but I knew just from looking at it that it was designed to fill a very specific purpose. I also knew that if I could figure out who it was that made the part, that I would be able to tell exactly what that purpose was for, but I did not know who made it. There was absolutely no markings on the part of any kind whatsoever. Beloved, many people live their lives in much the same manner in the fact that they will go through their lives, and to be honest, they will take and try and try to figure out the meaning of their life or the purpose of their life and figure out, what am I here up on this earth for? What is the purpose of my life? I mean, it, it, am I just, my purpose in life, is it just to be, be born into this world and of course be a child? To grow up, to go to school, to graduate, to make money and die? I mean, is, is that the purpose of my life? Is that the plan for which God has placed me upon this earth for? Why have you been placed here? Are you here by accident or are you here by design? In other words, when the Lord has placed you upon this earth of His, did He place you here just kind of to fill a void, if you will, or did he place you here with a specific purpose in mind? I feel like that we can safely say that the most fulfilled individual is the one who figures out exactly what their purpose in life is before they die. The most fulfilled individual will be the individual who figures out exactly what their purpose for being here on this earth and in this life is at some point before they die. We who are Christians have turned to the Word of God, the Bible, the Holy Word of God, in order to find the answer to this question. And we who are Christians have made a deliberate and conscious choice to place our faith and trust and hope for future in the revealed Word of God. You see, beloved, anyone who is a thinking individual, as you look at your life and as you look to the future, you will take and realize, you know what, I'd better have a plan on what I'm going to be doing. I have to have some place that I can fall back to, basically a safe place and be able to place my faith and my hope and my trust in this particular area. And every individual who is truly a child of God, they have taken at some point or another in their lives and they have taken and said, you know what, Everything else around me, I don't understand that. I don't know what is going on with everything else in the world. 
What I mean by that, someone may take and say, you know, I believe my pur purpose in life is to be a patriot, to, to be so, so loyal to the United States of America above all else. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But then lo and behold, when you see the United States of America going down the tubes, then you can get the feeling like, have I put my eggs in the wrong basket? I'm not saying move out of America or anything like that. But what I'm saying, beloved, is where have you placed your faith? your hope, your trust, your desire for eternity, where have you placed that at today? If it is anything other than the Word of God, then your hope for the future, it is on shaky ground. It is on sandy soil, if you will. Now, beloved, as Christians who have decided, who the Lord has convicted us and shown us that only in His Word is a worthwhile place to put our faith and trust, it is at this point that each of you must ask yourselves, where do you have your faith placed at today? Do you totally trust the Scriptures? Do you totally trust the Word of God? There are many people who they have taken and placed their trust in a bottle of alcohol. They have taken and said, you know what, as long as I can pretty well stay drunk most of the days of my life, then I feel like I have pretty good hope for the future. As long as the alcohol do not run out, then I feel like my life will be pretty good. And the truth is that if they die sober, they die miserable people because they realize that their life has been spent in vain. Some people kind of feel like, and it's a common thing, some people kind of feel like, you know what, if I can take and have plenty of money. I mean, there are a lot of insecure areas in life. There are a lot of unknowns in life. And I feel like if I can have plenty of money in the bank, and once again, nothing wrong with money in the bank. But if that money in the bank, if those riches are the things that you're placing your hope and your trust and your confidence in, what do you do when the bank goes belly up? What do you do when that time comes that you feel like, man, some, some things are going bad in society and I'm going to go to the bank and get my money. And you go to the bank and the doors are locked. And they say, sorry. What do you do then? Some people will take and place their faith and their trust in education or human achievements. Now once again, beloved, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with having money in the bank. We're, we're not speaking evil against that at all. Some, by the same token, some people take and place their trust in education or human achievements that they feel like, you know what, if I study enough, if I study long enough and hard enough, and when I get one doctorate's degree and two doctorate's degree, and there's nothing wrong with that, we should strive for excellence in our life, strive for learning. But if that is the area where you place your faith and your trust, what do you do then if after all of those degrees and everything else you wind up being diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 55 years old. You go around and look at those degrees on your wall and say, what did I get this for? Where did this come from? And then what do you do? Now, beloved, once again, I, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with human achievements or education or money in the bank. But in order to ascertain or discover the real purpose of our lives, what have we been placed here for? Do we long to have a fulfilled life? What have we been placed here for? Look with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah chapter number 9, verses 23 and 24. The Bible says there in Jeremiah chapter number 9, verses 23 and 24, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord. Now once again, we ask you earlier, where have you placed your faith and trust at? Do you have your faith and trust in the Word of God? Is this the place where you have your confidence at? The Bible says, this is God speaking to us today. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. The Bible doesn't say wisdom is a bad thing, but it says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. We live in a day and age, beloved, especially uh, that which comes out of Hollywood, that if a man is young and strong and has big muscles, once again, there's nothing wrong with being physically fit or in good shape. But if an individual, whether it's a man or a woman, they place all of their confidence in being strong and having good muscles, what do you do when you blow your back out when you're 25 or 30 years old and then it, it pains you to lift up a paper clip? In other words, if you go through life and you feel like, man, as long as I stay fit and I stay healthy, man, I will have achieved, I'll be fulfilled in life. It doesn't work. 
Maybe you say, why doesn't it work, brothers? Because the Bible says that it won't work. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this. The Bible tells us exactly what we need to glory in, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Let me ask you folks a question. How much value does this world place on a relationship with God? Not very much at all. It's coming to the place more and more in our society that anyone who has a, a personal relationship with the Lord, if you speak of it publicly, oftentimes the world without, they will ridicule you. They will call you some kind of a fanatic. Will you believe in an old antique, archaic book that doesn't address our day and age? Beloved, it does too address our day and age. And it doesn't matter what the world thinks of our relationship with God. It doesn't matter if the world sees us glorying in God, whether they approve or disapprove. All that really matters is, is my worship acceptable in the sight of God? Am I glorying in the right things? But let him that glorieth, glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Beloved, it is certainly not the end of the message just yet. Don't get your hopes up. But in a nutshell, the life of the individual which has a fulfilled life is towards that person who has come to the place that they delight in the same things that God delights in. To reach the point in our life where all of the things that God delights in, we also delight in those same things. We glory in that which the Lord glories in, if you will. Now, as we ask ourselves, what is the purpose for us being here? Either we will submit to the authority of the Scriptures, or we will not. Half-hearted submission will not get you very far. You submit to the authority, or I ask of you today, do you submit to the authority of the Scriptures? Do you obey them? The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Beloved, as we think about these things, how much do we submit to the Word of God? The Bible also tells us, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I fear that we live in a day and age where there are many people that know the Word of God, but as the Bible says, uh, that you're happy if ye do them. It is not a matter just to know the Word of God, but it is also a matter of doing the things contained in the Word of God. So once again, I go back to the original question. What is the purpose of your life? Why are we even here? You see, there are many peripherals which we may get involved in. A man may get involved if you're married, a husband, a father. A man may feel like, well, my purpose in life is to be a husband and father. No, that's one of the things that you may be called to in life. But is that your supreme purpose for being here? The woman may feel like, well, you know what? It's my purpose in life to, to be a good wife and mother. Yes, the man should be a good husband and father. The woman should be a good wife and mother. Of course, those things are declared in the Scripture as well. But is that the, in, the supreme purpose for every individual in being here? What is your pur purpose for life, if you will? You see, we will also mention this. If you believe that you came from a monkey and you refuse to be persuaded otherwise, then to be honest with you, this message isn't for you. Maybe you say, well, that's a terrible thing to say, just because I believe that I came from, my, from a monkey. In other words, beloved, if we're all just here by happenstance, or chance, if you will, then maybe we have a purpose to fulfill, and maybe we, we, I'm sorry, maybe we don't have a purpose to fulfill. I get my tongue kind of tied up, Amen. I think I'm starting to speak French in the pulpit. Wee oui, wee, oui, amen. <laughs> but if we're just here simply by accident and for no other purpose, if we're just simply evolved from a monkey, and lo and behold, we're just here to breathe the oxygen for a while, maybe you have a purpose to fulfill, and maybe you don't. Now think with me about this, beloved. Everything that God does... He does with a distinct purpose in mind. In other words, there's absolutely nothing whatsoever in all of God's creation 
that he has ever done, but what that which he was doing did not he have a purpose in mind for. In other words, each and everything that the Lord created, he created it with a purpose in mind. And we may not understand each and every purpose of whatever it is that we're discussing, but we know that everything that he does, he does with a purpose. Absolutely everything which he has created, Everything what she has done, he has done with a definite purpose in mind. Now some of these things fill a temporal purpose, and some of them fill an eternal purpose. But with our lives, beloved, according to the Bible, we human beings have an eternal purpose to fulfill. Look with me in your Bibles to John chapter number 3 and verse number 16. The Bible says there in John chapter number 3 and verse number 16, the Bible says there, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Beloved, does this not point to something above and beyond just our temporal life here upon this earth? Does this not teach us that there is a purpose which we will fulfill someplace either in heaven or in hell? Now think with me about this. Look also in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter number 16. The Bible says there in Luke, chapter number 16, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. We see two different men here. One man doing very well in life. The other man was a beggar. The Bible says there in verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Now once again, as we see these two people in life, which one of these men would the world call successful? And which one of these men would the world call an abysmal failure? Would they not look at the man who's rich and say, Man, he is unwell in life. I'm telling you what, he's good to go. He's set, man. He is successful. We want to be like him. He's the rich man, if you will. And if one, someone were to take and look at the beggar, would we not look at the beggar and say, Man, I hope and pray I never turn out like him. I hope and pray that my children never turn out like him. I hope and pray my daughter never marries a man like this man that's a beggar, if you will. And yet, beloved, we realize the Bible is not speaking necessarily against the evils of being rich or the positive things of being poor, but the Bible is simply showing us these two men at these points in their lives. The Bible says in verse, 21, or verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. Now, beloved, think with me about this. It does not matter how much money an individual has, one day they will die. It, you can have $50 billion in the bank, or you can have zero dollars in the bank. But apart from the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, each and every individual, they will indeed taste death. Now, at that point when they died, the Bible says of the rich man, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son... Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. Now, beloved, here's the point. The Bible is teaching us here, that there will be something which awaits each of us after death. There will be a place which awaits those who are lost after death, and there will be a place which awaits those who are saved after death. And here's the thing that you must realize today. After you have already died and you have found yourself in these places, then you will be there for all eternity. In other words, it is not a matter that after an individual dies that we can pray you out of a place or that we can pay someone to usher you out of a place where you are, beloved. And the things that you do in this life with regards to a relationship with God, they will be the defining point of where you spend eternity at. 
Beloved, I would to the Lord that we would not take these things lightly, but rather that we would take them seriously. There are some sects and some cults who they will take and say, you know what, that, that's just a little bit too harsh. I don't believe that there is a hell. I believe personally that when you die, as some people say, when you die, if you know the Lord, then you will go to heaven. And if you don't know the Lord, then you will just go there and lay in a casket in the ground. And your soul and your spirit will die, and that's the end of it. And there have been times that I've brought this passage up to such people as that, and they will take and say, that's only a parable. That's not really true. It is only a parable. Beloved, it is not a parable, but it is indeed the truth of the Word of God. Now you have the opportunity this day to wonder, to think about, beloved, your relationship with God, your purpose in life, your purpose for being here, and what is that purpose? Look with me in your Bibles to Psalm 139. The Bible says there in Psalms 139, beginning in verse number 13, the Bible says, For thou hast possessed my reins, Psalms 139, verse number 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in the secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Beloved, think with me about this. The Lord knows exactly each and every individual who is upon the face of this earth. He has created you and He has designed you. He has made you and placed you where you are today. Now, once again, the purpose I go back to or the point that I go back to is what is your purpose in being here? What is your purpose in life? What is it that you're supposed to be doing during the years which the Lord has entrusted to you upon His earth? Look with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 7. The Bible says there in Exodus chapter number 7, reading just a few verses here in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter number 7 and verse number 5. The Bible says the Lord had been dealing with the children of Israel and the Egyptians there. And the Bible says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Now, beloved, I want you to notice that phrase right there where the Bible says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. They will know that God is indeed God. Maybe you say, Brother Spears, what's the point of all of this? Beloved, the point of this verse as well as the following verses which we will read is to prayerfully cause us to understand that our purpose in life, the purpose which God has placed us here for, for this point in time, is that we would come to know that He is the Lord. He's in control of all things. He has eternity in His hand with regards to His creatures, if you will, and He can do as He pleases. The Bible also says there in Exodus chapter number 8, in verse number 10, the Bible says there, and He said, Tomorrow... And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. I ask of you, beloved, what think ye of Christ? What think ye of God today? Look also there in verse number 22 of Exodus chapter number 8. The Bible says, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. Now why is he going to do that? To the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Have you ever acknowledged in your life that He is truly God? In other words, have you ever submitted yourself unto Him as He is the Lord, the sovereign God, the creator of everything upon this earth? Have you ever surrendered yourself to Him, your will to Him? Have you ever came to the point in your life that you acknowledge that He is God? He's God. Now think with me, beloved. When you, if you're driving down the road and you're speeding and a policeman gets behind you and he turns his lights on, you know what? There are sometimes they tell me that there are policemen who are not actually policemen at all. They buy lights somewhere. They buy themselves a uniform and they go out and they pull people over and they say, well, just give me 50 bucks and we'll forget about the speeding ticket. In other words, they are an imposter, if you will. But think with me about this. If it is a real, genuine, legitimate police officer, when he comes up behind you and he turns his lights on, 
on, you'd better be submitting to him. In other words, if he gets on his VA system, he starts saying, pull over, pull over. You know what? You had better acknowledge his authority over you or you're going to be in trouble. Now, beloved, here's the point. When we acknowledge that the Lord, He is God over all of the earth, over all of His creation, what we will do when we acknowledge that the Lord, He is God, is that we will submit ourselves unto Him. In other words, we will come to the place that we will take and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, you're the one who is all-knowing. You are the one who knows what is best for my life. I don't know these things. And Lord, I simply want to spend my life living it not for my glory, but for thy glory and thine alone. Beloved, this is the essence of the life which is a fulfilled life upon this earth, that we will know that the Lord, He is God in the midst of the earth. Look also there in Exodus chapter number 9 and verse number 14. The Bible says there in Exodus chapter number 9 and verse 14, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. Let me ask of you today, just how great is your God? Now we know those who are truly saved, who truly know the Lord. We know how great God is, the God of the Bible. But my point is there are times that people live their lives in such a manner that they will say, well, the, the Lord, I believe that He is God, but I only have to submit to Him whenever I feel like it. I only have to submit to Him when I understand His leading in my life. I only have to submit to Him when I think I should submit to Him. In other words, beloved, you're the one that's in control of God. In your mind, you have an imaginary God, and you feel like that you're in control of Him. You will manipulate Him. When times are bad, boy, you will get all serious and earnest in your prayer. And when times are good, you will tuck Him away in a closet and pretend as though he does not exist. Now, beloved, what was the means by which the Lord used in order to educate the people there in the land of Egypt, the Egyptians, if you will? What was the means which the Lord used to educate him about his greatness? God used things which were beyond control of the children or of the Egyptians there in their land. In other words, God was pleased to bring things into their life which they could absolutely not control. God was pleased to send swarms of light and they were powerless to do anything about it. God was pleased to send a thick darkness over all the land of Egypt there except for where His children was at. And God did these things to the extent that they would realize, you know what? God is so great. He's so mighty. He's so powerful. And what else can we do but submit to Him? And yet there's still people who will take and say, we're not going to submit to Him. We will not obey Him. We will not acknowledge that He is Lord over all of His creation. Look with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter number 16. What is your purpose in life, beloved? What is my purpose in life? 1 Chronicles, chapter number 16, in verses 23. 1 Chronicles, chapter number 16, beginning in verse number 23. The Bible says there in 1 Chronicles chapter number 16, beginning in verse number 23, Sing unto the Lord all the earth, show forth from day to day His salvation. If you are here today and you're truly a child of God, then your greatest purpose in life, your highest calling in life, is to do exactly what the Bible says, declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations. Beloved, the purpose for which the Lord has created us for and placed us here upon this earth is that He might receive the glory from our existence here. Think with me about this. The Bible says there, Sing unto the Lord all the earth, show forth from day to day His salvation. For those of you who are here this day and Christians, let me ask you something. Do you show forth from day to day the Lord's salvation in your life? In other words, the way that you live your life, do you live your life in such a way that God is honored, that God is glorified from your life? Do you live your life in such a way that you're showing to other people around you the salvation of God, that it is real in your life? Once again, verse 24, declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations. Are you declaring God's glory among the heathen? When people look at your life, are they able to look at your life and take and say, man, there's something different about the way they live their life in the way that the rest of the world is living their life. There's something different about them. And then maybe they will come and say, you know what, it seemed like 
You don't run after all the same things the rest of the world runs after. It seems like you live your life by a different set of rules. What is it? May I ask you, what is it? I see something very different about you, but I don't understand what it is. And they may come and ask you, what is it? That is the time that we can take and declare the glory of God in our lives. Take and say, the difference in me is through no credit to myself, but all the glory goes to God. The reason that I'm able to get up every day and put a smile on my face even when I don't feel like it is because I have a God who is in heaven who is working all things according to His divine glory. And I know that they're going to work for my good and His glory. So what else can I do but to be satisfied and happy in Him? Maybe someone who has boatloads of money will come to you and that person with boatloads of money, maybe they don't have much joy in their lives. They don't have much joy in their heart. And they will look at you and they say, you know what, it's a pretty well known fact. You don't have a lot of money in the bank, but how is it that you're so happy and you're poor as a church mouse, but yet I have all kinds of money in the bank and I don't have that joy in my heart? What's the difference in you and me? That's the time that we can say God is the one that has made the difference. God made the difference there. God is the one who has given me this. The Bible says, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in His presence. Strength and gladness are in His place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory, do His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. And let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. Beloved, it would do us well today as Christians, whenever the problems come into our life, to be able to take and simply proclaim, the Lord reigneth. Does this mean everything's going the way that I really, really want it to go? Maybe not. Does this mean that I understand everything that God is doing? Oftentimes, absolutely not. But the one confidence that we as Christians have is the fact that the Lord reigneth. Beloved, let the United States of America turn just as wicked as they want to. God still reigneth. The Lord still reigneth. Let my health completely fall apart and let let me be smitten with... Terrible health, if that be the Lord's desire and will for my life. But yet, my God still reigneth. He's still in control, beloved. Let us have three feet of snow or no snow at all this winter, and the Lord still reigneth. We can still be happy in that, beloved. You see, this is the life which is truly fulfilled when we come to this place that we can take and say, My God reigneth. The Lord is in control of everything. Absolutely everything. And nothing will take place apart from Him allowing it to take place and causing it to take place. And because I know that He loves me, I can rest like a baby in these things. Beloved, is this not a blessed relationship when we have a relationship like this with our parents? Maybe our parents will take and come to us and they can say, you know what, little child, you have to take your medicine. And the child, if the child trusts their parents, they will take and say, you know what, I don't like the taste of that medicine. But because you're my mother, because you're my father, I know that you want what's best for me. And I know that you're giving me this medicine because it's for my good. And when the child fully trusts their parents in such a way as that, where they can take and say, I know that my parents want what's best for me. Thus I will submit to them. Beloved, is it not even more so our relationship with the Lord? When the hard times come, when things come into our lives that we don't understand, to be able to sit back and simply say, The Lord reigneth. The Lord reigneth. Oh, Brother Spears, haven't you heard about the economy and everything that may happen with the economy? The bottom may drop out of all of it. The dollar may not be worth the paper that it's printed on. may not be there today. Amen? But people take and say, man, what are we going to do when that takes place? The Lord reigneth. Maybe we take and say, look how corrupt our government is. Just look at all of the corruption there. You know what? The Lord still reigneth. 
Beloved, in all of these things, and I encourage you, whenever hard times come into your life, acknowledge the fact that the Lord reigneth and glory in Him and glorify His name because of that. The Bible says, let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out of the presence of the Lord because He cometh to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And say ye... Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever, and all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Beloved, when we reach the point that we are able to praise the Lord, no matter what circumstances we are in, then we will be living the kind of life which is honoring unto the Lord. Look with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter number 4. And we will read just a few verses there. Daniel chapter number 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible says there in Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place shall be with the beast of field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. Now what was God's purpose in doing all of these things in the life of this man, in the life of Nebuchadnezzar? What was God's purpose? Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You know what Hezekiah had gone through, or Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, had gone through many bad things. The Lord had brought him through those things. See, Nebuchadnezzar had come to the point that he felt like, man, you know what? All of this kingdom is mine. Look what I have done in my life. Look what I have made in my life. Look at all that I have accomplished in my life. And you know what? He was not willing to give any glory whatsoever to the God of all creation. The Lord said, you know what, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to put you out in the field and we're going to let you eat grass like an ox till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Notice on over there, on down at verse 32, the Bible says, And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou, thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Notice on down there, beginning in verse 34, the Bible says, after all of these things, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, had lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed is nothing, and he doeth according to his will, and the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me." Now, beloved, read there verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Beloved, all of those things Nebuchadnezzar had come through to the, to the intent that he would glorify the Lord finally rather than honoring and glorifying himself. Beloved, if we think about this, each and every individual, beloved, you see, all people, all people were created for the purpose of honoring and glorifying God. That's your purpose in being here, to honor and glorify the Lord. Now here's the thing. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I'm not a member of your church. I don't even profess to be a Christian. Are you telling me that I'm also going to honor and glorify a God which I don't even believe in? Look with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter number 14. The Bible says there in Romans chapter number 14, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says there, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, half of the knees shall bow to me. Seventy percent of the knees, they'll bow. Seventy percent of people, they will bow. The Bible says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. 
and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let me tell you something. Each and every person who has ever been blessed to live upon God's green earth here, the time will come that you will bow the knee before God. And it is not a matter of if you will bow the knee, but it is a matter of when. Now here's my point. Those who have come to know the Lord in salvation have come to the place in their life that they have bowed the knee to God as Nebuchadnezzar did. And he said, you know what? God is God and I'm not. The Lord reigneth. It's not my reign upon this earth. It is not just all about me, but it is about God. You see, God will be glorified through your existence either negatively or positively. Now think with me about this today. We're almost done. If there was a heart surgeon which has two patients and both with bad hearts, he tells both of them, you need to eat, ride, and exercise. One obeys and recovers, and the other one disobeys and dies. Is the doctor not honored in both patients? Maybe you say, well, no, he's, he's not honored in the patient that died. Of course, that, that's not honoring to the doctor. Now think with me about this, beloved. If the heart surgeon takes says, you know what? I'm the doctor. I know these things. I've studied these things. I've had a lot of experience in these things. And if you will eat right, if you will exercise, then your heart will do well. And if you continue not to eat right, not to exercise, you continue to abuse yourself, your heart is going to let you down. In other words, beloved, whether you obey Him or whether you disobey Him, if you're the one that you do not obey Him and your heart lets you down, then people will still be able to say, the doctor was right all along. They should have listened to the doctor. Well, beloved, when God tells you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. For those who will take and truly repent of their sins and turn to God and salvation, beloved, God is honored in your life because you're saying, He is Lord, He is God over all of His creation. And for those who sit back and take and say, I don't believe Him, I don't trust Him, I don't want anything to do with His way of salvation. One day, when judgment day comes, and you, the angels, angels are ordered to bound you hand and foot and cast you into the lake of fire, God will be honored even in that. Now maybe you're here today and say, I don't like the sound of that. I, I don't like that. You mean God is going to do that to me? God has made a way of salvation for everyone who is willing to accept it. Everyone who will trust Christ. Everyone who will turn from their sins and trust in God for salvation. Believe in what Christ has done there upon the cross of Calvary. There's been a way of salvation made for you. But for those who will take and turn away from that and take and say, I don't want anything to do with it, then indeed you will receive your just reward. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, beloved, I ask of you in closing... Have you bowed the knee to Christ already? In other words, while you have been alive upon this earth, have you bowed the knee before Christ already? Do you submit to Him? Do you honor Him? Do you acknowledge the fact that He is Lord, that He is God? Do you submit to Him in every area of your life? And I know some want to say, well, no one does that. But is it your heart's desire to glorify Him in every area of your life? Or are you here today and you're sitting back saying, I don't even believe in God. I don't trust in His way of salvation. I don't think that I need it. You see, beloved, the Bible tells us that one day there will be a day of reckoning. And oftentimes we feel like, you know what, I, I'm still healthy. I don't have any imminent health problems that I know of, anything that's real bad wrong with me. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. It furthermore says, For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Beloved, let me tell you folks something. God has entrusted you, some with a few years of life, some with many years of life upon this earth, to come to a saving knowledge of Him, to learn about Him. And I ask of you this day, are you honoring and glorifying the Lord through your existence today? That's your purpose in life. Or are you still like that little tool that we spoke of earlier, a little piece of equipment that no one really ever knew what it was? Sad to say many people will live their years of life out upon this earth and they never really come to the place that they realize what it is that you've been placed here for. Let me tell you something today. Your purpose in life is to glorify God. Glorify Him. If you're here this day and you're lost, glorify Him by believing what He has said about your sinful condition, about your utter inability to save yourself and trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. 
If you're here today and you're saved, maybe you take and say, well, I don't know if my life is honoring and glorifying to the Lord or not. Beloved, everything that you put your hand to in life, and I mean everything that you put your hand to, when you get up in the morning, may the way that you walk to, the, to your automobile bring glory to God. If you're a working, if you work somewhere, then may the way that you conduct yourself on the job, may that honor and glorify the Lord. If you're here today and your mother is staying home taking care of children, may the way that you take care of your children, may that honor and glorify the Lord. If you're here today and you're retired, no matter who you are or what you do, beloved, you may glorify the Lord through your existence here. Now I ask of you this day, do you glorify the Lord in and through your life? Let's all stand, Brother Arthur, if you'll come.